Okay, so I have decided to skip to Henry Lee Lucas and Otis Toole because it's really interesting to me. And I want to apologize for the light not being great. I'm in my bedroom and we only have one light over here. Uh, we have a window over here, but it is nighttime, so that's not going to do me much good. So, this chapter really goes more into depth on Henry Lee Lucas's life and not really into Otis Toole, but it does talk about him. So, <clears throat> Oh, and I want to give you a disclaimer. This gets very, very graphic. So if you are squeamish, I would suggest not watching. Okay. So <clears throat> it has been said that Henry Lucas killed more than 300 people, and that is false. Um, there was a show about him on Netflix, I think it's been taken off, but it was called The Confession Killer, and that's because Henry Lucas committed to or confess to a bunch of murders that they don't think he committed. Um, his compatriot, is the word it says, and lover, Otis Toole, so another man, was no slouch in the murder department either. They traveled across the country in the 70s and 80s, committing many of their murders along um, Interstate 35, which is from Laredo, Texas to Gainesville, Florida. So it's a long stretch. So, <clears throat> there has been some debate over whether Lucas was actually the perpetrator of all the murders he confessed to. Because, again, he confessed to at least 300. The Texas Rangers, a law enforcement organization, which um, assists law enforcement departments um, in a kind of had expertise will travel capacity, kind of like um, the profilers, if you watch Criminal Minds, kind of like them. They say that Lucas was a genuine serial murderer, and in the mid-1980s, he cooperated with law enforcement all over the or law enforcement departments all over the country. The Rangers let Lucas travel to various states and be interviewed by various departments, and he helped clear hundreds of murders by confessing to them. So basically, he confessed these murders and uh, closed them. And, you know, I mean, I feel bad for the families that, you know, he confessed to these murders, he didn't commit them, and now these families don't have closure. You know? That's how I feel, but... <clears throat> so they say that Lucas the serial killer is more myth than fact, or some people do. In 1986, so near the end of their killing spree, or actually I think it was the end of the killing spree, Texas Attorney General Jim Maddox published the Lucas Report, a thick document that examines a number of murders Lucas confessed to and that allegedly proves how Lucas couldn't be the killer. I would love to read that. Just saying. <clears throat> so they are also ordinary people that don't believe he's the killer that he confesses to be, that he claims to be. One family, the Lemonsons of Lubbock, Texas, went to great lengths, including selling their house to uh, finance an investigation of Lucas's claims that he had killed their newly married daughter, 19-year-old um, Deborah Sue Williamson. So she was only a Williamson for a little bit because she was newly married when she died. <clears throat> their conclusion was that Lucas was not the killer. They claimed that Lucas did not know details of the case, such as the layout of the house, and believe their killer of the, their the, their daughter's murder was still at large. So like them, I feel bad for them. They don't. They're the person who murdered their daughter still at large. I wonder if it was their son-in-law. I think it was probably their son-in-law, but you know, whatever. <clears throat> so the result was a report in the Dallas Times Herald that discredited dozens more of the murders Lucas claimed. So there's a bunch of murders that... And see, the thing is, is that a lot of the murders he confessed to, he knew how they were killed, if they were decapitated or not, where they were buried. I mean, he knew all of these things that were never revealed to the media. They were never revealed to the public. He knew all of these things. And that is why he... They believe that he is the killer. The dog is trying to get out, and she can. The door is open, but she's having issues, apparently. So, now, 
if Lucas did commit all these and cleared them, it would make the Rangers look good because they owned the clearance weapon in so many cases from the 1970s and 80s. So it could be, so it, it's possible that there are other murderers involved in these crimes and the police just didn't want to solve them. That's the possibility. It's impossible to know for sure <clears throat> how many murders he actually committed, but he was beyond a doubt a serial killer and an active one. And it's definitely possible that he lied about some confessions or was somehow coerced or conned into giving them. Or perhaps he was the con. Confessing to more and more crimes to boost his notoriety. Like maybe he was trying to get more recognition. <clears throat> or he was just trying to mess with the authorities and the rangers. I mean that's absolutely a possibility. But... Lies aside, there have to be other murders he confessed to that he did commit. Now, this goes. This is where, you're, if you're squeamish, you might want to <laughs> stop watching because this is about Henry Lee Lucas's childhood, and it is sad. It was, as they say in the book, horrific. So it, there's no doubt that Lucas had a childhood that can incite a murderous rage in anybody. Okay, he was raised in a this is what uh, Ron Rosenbaum said in Vanity Fair. These are his words. He was raised in a fairly primitive log cabin-like dwelling in an isolated backwoods county in West Virginia. The kind of hillbilly milieu that produced the predators of deliverance. I love those. I love those words. I think that is a really great way to describe it. <clears throat> so appropriately, the name of the town was Blacksburg. The same town, in fact, where a gunman went wild at Virginia Tech and killed 32 people in April of 2007. So, it wasn't the town that did Henry Lee Lucas in. It's not. It was mainly his mother. Lucas claims that he was brought up like a dog and no human being should have to endure what he endured. He said, no human being should have to be put through what I was. So that shows that he does have empathy, is that he knows that no person should have to go through that. That's actually an amazing thing. A lot of serial killers don't have empathy. So his step stepfather, nicknamed No Legs, because his legs were taken off by a slow-moving freight train. So, you know, that's real original. Never would have guessed that. But yeah, called him No Legs. <clears throat> he was an alcoholic who lost his legs to a slow-moving freight train. He did not buy prosthetics. He didn't buy prosthetic legs. He just slid around the bare dirt floor of the shack that they called home, propelling himself on his stumps. I don't know if it was below his knees. I don't know if it was his whole leg. I don't know. All I know is that he had stumps and he just didn't buy new limbs. <clears throat> Lucas claims he hopped around on his ass all his life. That is his his words. Okay, this is about his mother, Viola. The book says, and I love the wording, part Cherokee, all monster. I love that. Okay, so, Viola Lucas. She was a part-time prostitute who used to service, service men in their house, in their log cabin, and force her husband, No Legs, to watch. He would watch as long as he could and then get sick. So he's literally watching his wife service other men until he got sick. On the final occasion he watched, which was a winter day in 1950, he was so overwhelmed by what he was seeing, it doesn't tell us what it was, just that he was overwhelmed by it, that he dragged himself out into the cold and snow-covered landscape and laid there all night. I don't know if that man went home and No Legs was asleep, but he stayed there all night and within a week he died. He had, ca he had caught pneumonia that night. So, Viola also made Henry Lee watch her practice her profession from the ripe old age of eight until he was 14. That is six years, y'all. 
from 8 to 14, his mother made him watch. Okay? Can you imagine that? I can't. <clears throat> now, this is the part that is not as graphic. She liked to dress him as a little girl when he watched her practice her profession. But, not just that, she also dressed him as a little girl when he went to school. She would, I mean, she went all out. She was even, she would go so far as taking pains to curl his then long blonde hair. She would curl it, she'd put him in a dress, she I mean, everything. When he wasn't dressed as a girl, he went to school dirty and smelly and dressed in ragged clothes. So if he wasn't dressed as a girl, he was dressed like his life explained, poverty, basically. One teacher there remembered that he was particularly pathetic among a group of students who came from poverty-stricken families, and that the other ch children constantly taunted him, especially about his glass eye, because he had lost an eye to an accident when he was seven, so he had one glass eye. <clears throat> Now, one would have to search very hard to find a mother who is crueler than Viola Lucas was. She relished her cruelty, even reveled in it. Okay, I mean, she thought that that proves that she was all monster. She was the antithesis of warm and nurturing, which is what most people expect a mother to be. You know, we expect our mothers to be warm and happy and nurturing, and she was the exact opposite of any of that. She would verbally tear him apart, detailing what a worthless person and what a burden she thought he was to her. <clears throat> Physically, she was a savage. She beat him constantly with anything that she could get on her hands on, including a two-by-four. Okay? Years later, the damage from her beatings would show up in CAT scans of Henry Lucas's brain. So, it was not only constant, her violence, but it was also inspired. For example, Henry Lucas became very affectionate of this mule that they had. Okay, he loved this mule like his child, basically. And one day, Viola asked him if he liked this mule. And he said, yes, I love this mule very much. And that was enough for her. She went out into the shed, got her shotgun, went to the mule, and killed it while making her son watch. Then, she beat Henry Lucas for burdening her with the removal of that animal that she just shot. So, that's just, I mean, if, like, if I went to Jake and said, do you love Sadie? And he says, yes, very much, which he does. I would not then shoot her and then beat him for making me have her removed. Just saying. That's a little extreme. But I'm also not his mother. I'm his wife. That's different. So anyway, Henry Lucas's diet was minimal and he really suffered from malnutrition. Um, and there was excessive amounts of lead found in his body because he would try to supplement what he got at home by foraging through garbage cans. And so, you know, there was a lot of Thrown, stuff that was thrown out. So a lot of things that had uh, lead or too much iron or whatever. You know, so there was a lot of that. And the effects of his mother's savagery started showing up fairly early. So for those of you that don't know, there's something called the homicidal triad. It is three things that people look for when determining a serial killer. It is cruelty to animals, bedwetting, and arson. And not so much arson, it's starting small fires. Um, but those are the three things. If you can find one of them, um, it's not necessarily that they're going to be a serial killer. You need to find them in two or three. Twos or threes. You need to have at least two or all three of them. So it started with his cruelty to animals. He and his half-brother, so he did have a half-brother, is probably his stepfather's son, but I don't know. Um... <clears throat> They got into the habit of killing farm animals, and again, if you're squeamish, you might want to turn away, because after they killed the farm animals, they would then um, have sexual intercourse with them. 
And that is a, year, a practice that Henry Lucas would continue on later in his life, but with humans. He would also pleasure himself by skinning small animals alive. And by the age of 10, he was drinking like a fish, and he was an accomplished thief. So, yeah. <clears throat> so, Henry Lucas, by his own admission, started to kill people when he was 15 years old. <clears throat> he first attempted to rape a girl, and when she resisted, he strangled her and buried her. And later he would state it was his worst murder, not because he felt remorse, because, but because he was afraid that the police would track him down so he couldn't enjoy it. <clears throat> now, they never tracked him down, and he was able to eventually leave. And so he usually stole cars, money, whatever it was, get caught, get incarcerated, and then eventually get out. And he served time in Virginia State Penitentiary and a federal reformatory in Ohio. Now, 1959 was a good year for Henry Lucas because he murdered his mother. Now, she was staying in Michigan, Viola was staying in Michigan with Lucas' sister. And Lucas, freshly discharged from the penitentiary in Virginia, he had just gotten out, met her there, met her at his sister's house. He introduced his mother to a woman he had met named Stella that he said he was going to marry. Viola did not approve of Stella. And she also accused Henry Lee of molesting his nieces and nephews, his sister's children. They argued. Both were drunk. The argument got physical. And Henry Lee stabbed her in the chest. She laid on the floor for half of a day, bleeding out. Before her daughter found her. And then she died. So half a day, she laid on the floor, bleeding out, before her daughter found her. So when they were arguing, obviously his sister was not there. I think she would have found her faster had she been there. So Henry Lee was sentenced to 40 years and served time at Michigan State Penitentiary. <clears throat> and then prison changed him, but not in the way that the law enforcement hoped. Because before prison, he would kill out of fear or rage. And after prison, he just wanted to kill. Anything that had a heartbeat. So, in prison, he claims he heard his mother's voice ordering him to kill himself. <clears throat> so, he pulled a razor across his abdomen and his wrist in order to comply with what he thought was his mother's spirit talking to him. But he failed. Obviously. And it was one of many suicide attempts to follow, and he never, he never succeeded. So he also heard other voices, not just his mother telling him to do bad things. Um, so he was diagnosed as schizophrenic, which is basically when you feel, when you hear voices and you go into panic attacks sometimes. Um, he was a sexual psychopath who felt potent and became physically potent only when he was having sex with dead bodies. So he was impotent unless he was practicing necrophilia, which is disgusting, but you know. <clears throat> An FBI agent once asked Lucas why he only had sex with women after he killed them, and his response was, I like peace and quiet. Okay, I guarantee you there are men out there that wish their wives or girlfriends were quiet. It might be all men, I don't know. But most men are not disgusting sexual psychopaths. So <clears throat> he knew he was dangerous to himself and others. And when he was granted parole in 1970, so he was only grant he was granted parole only 11 years out of his 40-year sentence, he begged Michigan authorities to leave him in jail because he knew that he would kill if he's released. They did not listen to him. They let him out anyway. And he fulfilled his own prophecy by mur murdering a young woman that same day in Jackson. <clears throat> she lived only a few blocks from the state prison, so he didn't even get very far before he committed murder. So after the murder in Jackson, Jackson, Michigan, Lucas was on the move, and that's when he met Otis Toole. So they say that Otis Toole was always smiling. He was a very happy person. <clears throat> Now, Ron, Ron Rosenbaum, who interviewed Lucas on death row, said, described Tool as a six-foot-tall, occasional transvestite with a build like a lineman and a voice like Truman Capote's. 
I don't know who Truman Capote is, or Capote, however you pronounce it. I don't know who that is, but six foot, big build, and an occasional transvestite. Okay? Now, he was in Florida, and he had a very skewed sense of love and romance. And that was because his sister, Drusilla, I don't know why his mother named her Drusilla, but she, uh, anyway, Drusilla, his sister, raped him when he was young. So, years later, he would force Drusilla's daughter, Betty, have sex with men he picked up. And he enjoyed that. Now, among other claims to fame was, for Tool was the abduction, murder, and decapitation of Adam Walsh, a seven-year-old. He was the son of John Walsh, host of the television show America's Most Wanted. Can you imagine that? <clears throat> so, this man, who would eventually become a wanted man in America, killed the son of the host of America's Most Wanted. I just think that's ironic. And not in a good way. This could be a Lucas-like faux confession. Tool was never charged with or convicted of killing Adam Walsh, though he confessed to it many, many times. <clears throat> uh, now, granted, every time he confessed, he would retract his confession as well, so they weren't able to hold him to it. So, now, what precisely what Lucas and Tool did is debatable, but it's a safe assumption that their life together was a, I love this, spine-tingling compilation of sodomy, strangling, stabbing, cutting, shooting, necrophilia, dismemberment, and cannibalism. Like, uh, <clears throat> like Henry Lee said, Tool would barbecue them. So, <coughs> During the 70s and 80s, the highway, highway or Interstate 35, where they committed most of the murders, was virtually littered with hundreds and hundreds of bodies, okay? There was no consistent MO in the murders, which is probably why they couldn't connect it, and because it was all along Interstate 35, there were multiple different states that they covered, and um, jurisdiction stops at state lines, so... Police cannot be sure whether they were dealing with one perpetrator or many because of uh, dis different MOs and different states. Now, sometimes they were sexually assaulted, sodomized, shot, strangled, beaten, or dismembered, but that was not something that happened every single time. <clears throat> now, they all agree that Lucas killed Kate Rich, an elderly woman who lived in Wichita Falls, Texas. She was rich, lived near the House of Prayer, which was a chicken from the pen converted into a church, in case you're wondering. And two of the people that had been housed there were Henry Lucas and Otis Toole, which is where they met Kate Rich. So he stabbed her, chopped her up, and destroyed her remains by burning them in the stove on church property and then burnt her house down. Now, another one that he definitely committed, and the one that put him on death row, was the killing of orange socks. So, Orange Socks was an unidentified young woman found face down on the side of Interstate 35, strangled and nude except for some long pumpkin orange socks. So, that's how she got the name on Orange Socks. Now, these have been pulled down around her ankles because um, they weren't actually socks. They were stockings and she was nude except for them and they've been pulled down to her ankles. So, she was at, if she wasn't sexually assaulted, she was sodomized. Um, she was an attractive young woman with reddish brown hair, perfect teeth, a nice body, and a venereal disease. So there's a very good chance that she was a prostitute because she had a venereal disease. Lucas said she was hitchhiking, which is common for prostitutes at this time. He picked her up in Oklahoma City, drove toward Texas, um, and he made an exception for her. He sexually assaulted her while she was still alive. They continued on. He wanted to make it an even rarer day and have sex with her again. She told him, not now. He refused to take no for an answer, and this is what Lucas said. She tried to jump out of the car, and I grabbed her and pulled her back. We drove for a little piece further than that, and I pulled off the road because she was fighting so hard that I almost lost control of the car. After that, I pulled her over to me, and I choked her until she died. Then he had sex with the body, and dumped her in a culvert. 
So he was tried for that in San Angelo, quickly convicted, sentenced to death by lethal injection, and he was not chagrined by that idea, which is sad. He had tried to take his own life many times, and so now he's like, okay, I'm going to give the state a crack at it. Now, um, so it, they, they were capable of scores and hundreds of killings, perhaps. Now, how many people would want to go for a ride with them along Interstate 35 on a moonless November night? Chances are that the people are not clamoring and fighting each other for seats, okay? So, where are Lucas and Tool now? The answer in the book, word for word, taking a dirt nap. I love that. So, Tool was killed, or no, sorry, Tool died of cirrhosis of the liver in September of 1996. Henry Lucas Done on March 13th of 2001. My brother was born in September of 1996. My birthday is March 13th. So both of them died around or on our birthday. If See, if Otis Toole died on September 28th of 1996 in cirrhosis of the liver, he would have died the day my brother was born. And Henry Lucas died on my first birthday. Fun fact. But yes, they are both dead, and the world is probably better for it. But that's all I have. Um, sorry this video was longer. It's a lot to go into. Um, and honestly, I don't even think that scratched the surface of the horrific things that Henry Lucas and Otis Tool committed together. But that is all I have for you, and I hope you have a great day.